on fire I'm on fire news of the world hello hello i am uh marcus from the west i'm darcy from the east this is the west east brotherhood brotherhood woo or the <laughs> west east bros west, west east bros Westies bros. <laughs> Westies bros. It's like all oh, fucking one word, you know, because we live in the uh, uh, what millennium is it? The the second millennium? The third? We're in the third millennium, or <laughs> I don't know, the third after Jesus millennium. Oh, whatever I see. that means. Yeah, yeah. But of course, we're in the like. I don't know. When did humans begin? <laughs> When did all the Cro-Magnons and all that happen? I don't know. What are what are Cro-Magnons? Cro-Magnons. Oh, Cro Cro-Magnon man. I don't. I see. I don't even know if I'm using the correct terms. But you know, if we're going to, um, well, there's prehistorical times, uh, but those are definitely humans. But then we're going back to like, oh man, I don't know enough about all the different generations of um, pre-human Cro-Magnon type people that were almost people but not quite people because they hadn't evolved enough yet but super interesting to read about um <laughs> a lot of those people and uh the evolutionary um theories to how does these hairy upper strong upper body apes you know get out of the trees and into the savannah and then start losing hair and, and all. I, I find that like super interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely do too. Yeah. I, I like an, one of the topics that we've had on here is the, uh, the history of stuff where, where stuff comes from helps. the Where con- does stuff come from? Well, I guess it comes from the planet. <laughs> <laughs> we dig it up and we mash it together and, and figure out some sort of thing to make with it and then distribute it. Uh, but now we're into all this buying and selling of its, uh, hmm. and that's sort of taken over the creation of things. And now we live in the society where a, a great portion of us don't create anything. <laughs> they, they just move stuff around. So if you don't know what I'm alluding to, I'm alluding to wall street. It's essentially just a bunch of people who are counting things. Um, they're not actually really connected to whatever they're supposedly invested in. Hmm. So that's something on my mind today. Also, role-playing games. <laughs> role-playing games. Okay. Oh, for sure. Like, uh, in what context? Um, you know, therapy is one context that I, I'm familiar with role-playing games. But what, what exactly were you talking about? Well, I've never thought of it in a therapeutic sense. I guess, sure, why not? Uh, it's a place where I gather with some of my, my longest, uh, oldest friends um, or most consistent friends in life, uh, get together and play role-playing games. We've got some D&D &D campaigns on the go, but kind of excited about tonight because we are going to jump back into Call of Cthulhu, which is super mm -hmm. scary game. Uh, generally, you can set it in different times, but generally, it's always set in the 1920s. Uh, so it's it's a little more modern, you know, than fantasy play like um, like D and D. Uh, there's a little less uh, sort of superhero type thinking to the game. You're just kind of average folk, and you're um, you are investigating. So there there is a certain element of you know like not superhuman beings, but ex exceptional human beings. So I'm creating a character for the next campaign um, who's, uh, I can't quite decide, but you know, an explorer, uh, like a big game hunter. That These are careers that you can choose. You can either be an explorer or a big game hunter. And I'm on the fence. 
Should I be the explorer? Should I be the big game hunter? You know, I, I'm gathering wealthy donors to contribute to these big expeditions to go to Africa and search out stuff. And the thing about the Call of Cthulhu is it's all done in this world where there's this um, underlying evil that mm. sort of settles under this world that no one is completely aware of. And so it's just frightening. It's, it's really scary. Everything that you uh, encounter has this, this um, uh, macabre element. It's mm. very disgusting and, and ugh. like you'll encounter monstrosities. So like, um, you know, I remember campaigns where there was this guy in his basement and he was possessed by this evil thing and he was stealing body parts from, um, from morgues and from hospitals and he was trying to patch together um, his son who had died. And so it was this gigantic, like massive baby made of other people's body parts. So you have to roll, like, this is the thing. You, you don't necessarily, like D&D, &D, die from being wounded by things, but you can die by going insane. And when you encounter something like that, you have to roll against your power abilities to, like, go insane. You make a sanity check, essentially. So when all these <laughs> strange, bizarre things happen. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that description of that just, like, gave me the shivers. Totally. And we've got one of the best game masters in the world. Um, oh, you know, my, 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 my um, experience is limited. However, David is, is, is really good at this. You can, you can watch some of the episodes online. Um, it's a bunch of really talented people as well that play the game because you do require a lot of um, improvisation skills. So I was watching the campaign that they had finished two years ago, and we're going to pick it up from where they left off. And so you've, you've got these characters, you know, they're from New England and they're talking really fast and they're using New York accents and they're just making up it on the spot. You know, it's very, very dynamic, interesting role-playing game where you, you play the roles. Uh, that's the serious part of it. So looking forward to that. Wow. So you, um, like I remember you explaining this to me once before. But you don't have uh, like a visual stimulus to look at or something. You're like creating a narrative with people, right? Is that how it works? The majority of it, yes, is created. Uh, it's a collectively created narrative is what it is. Essentially, uh, Call of Cthulhu is creating a horror story <laughs> with uh, a bunch of people who play characters. And then the game master plays all of the additional characters that are needed to tell the story. Okay. And now that uh, there's a huge technological element, uh, we also share a screen of, uh, there'll be photographs of buildings that you're approaching. It's like you finally find the building where the weird guy is doing that creepy thing. And so you see you know, the building and sometimes you'll see the, the you know, like the, the floor plan inside a building, uh, that kind of thing, because it's sort of critical to whether you live or die. <laughs> if, you know, if you, you, if you enter that room, you know, like you fall through the floor and you end up in like this frozen cellar with a bunch of like undead ghouly type things that just eat you alive. <laughs> <laughs> um, and like that kind of weird shit might happen. And what's really interesting about this game is there's, there's this idea of the, the Cthulhu, the Cthulhu monster, which is this gigantic um, fish, essentially a, a giant octopus of some sort. No one knows. And that's what's brilliant about it. No one really knows what the Cthulhu actually is. People have these like, partial sightings of it because the way it goes is if you actually encounter cthulhu you're dead <laughs> you're just you're dead you'll never be seen again but you'll have these um 
glancing um, blows or glancing um, encounters. That's a better word. Glancing encounters with this Cthulhu monster that may or may not exist. You don't know. So you're just kind of scared the whole time. You're like, oh, no, no, what's going to happen? Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah, when you said role-playing games, I didn't realize the context. And now I'm like, oh, con context is everything. Wow, yeah. Definitely. So they, they um, abbreviate it to R -G RPG. That's, that's what that means, right? Yes. Yeah, RPG. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I was... I, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I, was, I was always confused about RPGs. I, for some reason, I thought that was specifically like Warcraft. Um, but that's... I, I'm assuming that's different. Um, I, I just don't know a lot about Warcraft. Uh... I think with all that, that game started in, in the internet generation, you know, all, all as computer, I, I believe. I've never seriously played it. The image I have in my mind of the game um, could be wrong. Like, that's how little I know. Um, I'm just thinking of a game a friend of mine used to play on his computer. And I'm like, I think that's Warcraft. And essentially, it's fantasy role-playing game, but all done on a computer. And for me, once you put it entirely on computer, then it's no longer a role-playing game. It's, um, it's a dexterity game. It's like, you know, I call it finger dexterity. It's, it that's, a, that's a video game. Well, anything that requires you to hit, hit the buttons very quickly, it's about your, your finger dexterity and your, your knowledge of the rules. Essentially, it, it could be it could be anywhere from Pac-Man to Warcraft. It's not really, you're not really playing the role. Mm, yeah. Whereas role-playing games face-to-face, -face, or we have to do it by Zoom, which is awesome because I've kept in contact with my friends um, all around the world, and we have this shared thing that we can do. Um, but the the point of it is the mental energy goes into – how do I respond to this situation? What do I do? What do I say? Um, should I engage? Should I run away? Should I try to charm this person into getting information out of them? Or should I try and intimidate them and be mean? Is it intimidating? Is that like being forceful and mean? Or is it being just very subtle and uh, showing just little hints of like, if you don't do what I'm asking you to do, I will cut your throat. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be just very, very simple with it. The, the character that I am creating, uh, I, I picture him, uh, I don't quite have a name. I, I, I do believe his last name is Revenel. Is it Revenel? Of South Carolina. And uh, he is a, a, fairly, um, a fairly nice gentleman. And very charming. But if you rub him the wrong way, he may not be so charming anymore. And he may tell you about some deep, dark past secrets that come from the South. And the folks that I know in the South know certain ways to deal with certain problems. And these people, they know what they're doing. So that's something you could say. I'm trying to intimidate them by by suggesting my character has connections to, you know, very dark forces in the South, something mm. like that. So it's very much like, um, well, role-playing game. I guess that makes complete sense. Like you being an actor, yeah. that, would, that would be, you know, like all, are all the people that you play with, are they also in, um, have done theater and acting and things like that or? Not all, but most by, you know, like almost all. And um, I shouldn't just say this out loud in case they find it, but actors make better players. <laughs> oh, <laughs> definitely. They definitely are much better at playing mm. the game. Um, in particular, when it's, it's, it's all a group of actors uh, playing this game. Um, mm. Because essentially you could, you could take one of the really well-played games and it's like, wow, there's a script for an awesome movie. Like, it's, it's got everything. And the climax moments tend to happen at the end. Because, you know, someone dies or 
or you find one of these monstrosity things, <laughs> you know, mm. um, or, well, that one happened actually the monstrosity one. We started in a city in New England and we found this monstrosity in the basement. And that would have been like act one of a movie. Cause then that led us on a quest across the Atlantic ocean. Um, and that would be act two, the whole like journey all the way down to the Middle East where we encounter um, a giant uh, worm that lives in the sand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's scary as shit, you know? <laughs> wow. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, I, I was going to comment and say like, um, of course, I used to absorb a lot of Jordan Peterson's material and not all the kind of clickbait stuff, but um, what he talks about on a psychological basis. And he was talking about art one time. Yeah. And he was suggesting that um, art, there's like stories that kind of, they, like an artist, they don't always know what they're creating until it's been created. Like they start mm. a project, they're, they're doing it. I mean, not all the time, but um, you start a project, you're doing it. And it's like they're they're taking the cult, like what's happening with in the culture or a story that's their own, and they might not know how to articulate that, but it's it's coming out in art. They're expressing it through their deepest sense of who they are, for example. And I was thinking about that, like that's huge with music. You know, you when you participate in music, especially in improvised music, what comes out is the story your narrative and that's why music is so um powerful um even if it's not a story with words uh, a visual artist the same thing will might could happen is you're uh you're relating your experience within the culture or within what you're experiencing uh in a relationship or or in a certain dynamic or whatever it, that it becomes expressed through art through the visual through painting or or whatever and I was also thinking, as you were explaining the uh, Cthulhu game, the role, the role playing game, I was like, man, that's pretty cool because it seems like everybody has their own. Correct me if I'm wrong. Everybody has their own unique role. They create a character. It seems like. Yep. And then they get thrown into the game, and then they're improvising. And what was fascinating when you said that everybody comes out, or sorry, some of them when you're playing with really good players, for example they can come out with like, oh, that's the script of a really beautiful or brilliant uh, film or, or uh, uh, the other word for film that's not film, but the story, narrative. Screenplay. Screenplay, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's, that was, that, that kind of came to my mind when you, were, when you were saying that. And I was like, it's, it's almost as if the story writes itself. And Absolutely, it's like it has its own life to it. When you bring more people in, it's like there's me and there's you, Darcy, all the way out in Nova Scotia, and then there is something else that's happening between us that is alive. But it's so hard to describe what that is. But it's it's its own thing. It's its own story. That is it exactly. Um, yeah, it's. Um, almost in a way, it's it's not really a game. Um, the the goal of the game is to create something dramatic and interesting. Um, and there are often times um, where, unlike a game where you try to survive, um, you're trying to um, create the most plausible way that that plays itself out. So uh, in almost every campaign of any role-playing game I will play, there'll be a critical um, life or death decision. Um, and in fact, since I mentioned the, the monstrosity baby monster, um, there was um, a part of someone's face that was attached to this monster and it was biting me and it was pulling me in and like arms were grabbing me and pulling me in. And in that moment, I decided uh, 
that I have to, um, I have to activate my grenade, even though I'm being held and it's probably going to kill me, but it will also hopefully kill this monster and it, I'm sacrificing myself. Oh man. But I didn't have to make that move because um, a bunch of other things happened and I ended up not being grappled anymore. So, oh, but no. I, <laughs> well, yeah, and, because the other players were doing what they would naturally do. And, and there's, you know, there's things that happen, mistakes happen, you know. Um, and it's, it's really um, freaky in a way because you use dice to figure out um, the different uh, paths that the story will take and it is amazing how often you'll roll the dice in a situation and go of course that's what happens you know that that just that just is absolutely right there was a D, &D game we were playing uh about a week ago um and we were going in this cart and a bunch of robbers surround us and the way the GM uh, described it was there's this woman who's a leader and they're like, ah, I think she's some sort of a witch. And then there's a bunch of like just regular town folk and they got bows and arrows and they're pointing them at us, but they, you know, they seem a bit unsteady. So we start essentially intimidating them like, hey, you know, back off. And then they're like shaking. And then when they roll the dice, a 20 sided die in D&D, in, in that one of them rolled a one, which means like a critical fumble, or like boom, they you know like they break, they break their bow and arrow, and then the next person rolls and they rolled a two, so it's like <laughs> this arrow goes flying off and like completely misses because we we successfully intimidated them, and the rolls actually even reflected that, which is just really bizarre, you know? Wow, that's so weird. Yeah. And, and every time that something happens, uh, the dice confirm kind of how the story is going in some some way. Hmm. Uh, but that's, I you know, I'm, I'm kidding in a way because I ultimately know it, it's us, the players, that are justifying what is happening. There is a reason why there was what you call a fumble or a critical hit or whatever. And it always seems to be perfectly timed. So maybe it's some. It, maybe there's something about the game that um, helps keep you in tune with the universe of like, you know, uh, connecting with, you know, everything has a reason. All all things are connected to each other, and that sort of thought of what is life. So it's a, in a way. It's the psychological discovery um, exercise and an art making exercise. I, I loved the way that you described it. It it is definitely we're we're just a bunch of we're just a bunch of goofballs getting together and making you know this weird story. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Yeah. I've I've been coming also well not coming to this idea but kind of trying to. Um, <laughs> you're laughing at my hair yeah I'm going bald there let's see if that looks better <laughs> actually <laughs> what were you saying <laughs> um, I was saying something about um, shoot what were we talking about? D and D. Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, we play. We talked about oh. role playing, and um, yeah, I, I don't know. It. You you called me, so um, you 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 asked to do this session. So maybe there was something burning question on your mind. Um, not exactly. Other than I wanted to maintain, wanted to keep it going. And yeah. It, well. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, well, I, I hesitated because I know we're we're role playing tonight, and I wanted to do a little bit of work on on my character and stuff. But then I was like, ah, no, let's just get it done, um, and then uh, and just you know, what the hell, you know? Mm. Okay, 
Well, we can we can keep it short if you want. Um, how long have we been recording? I don't know. I, I'm I'm looking at the clock. Um, but don't worry. I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll okay. tell you. Like, oh yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, like discipline and um, just you know being consistent is something that is um, you know it's hard to develop sometimes. Hmm. Um, there's some simplicity to what we're doing, and I like that. Um, I like longer form content that's essentially pretty darn easy to produce. Yeah. Like I, I'm not, I'm not going to lie to the audience out there. We're not trying to wow you with any technological gadget bullshit. Um, if you want that kind of, you know, stuff, then, you know, watch your Netflix. It's, it's actually pretty garbage material. Like, um, a lot of the heavily produced material, they really don't get into any sort of depth of thought of anything. All of it's just very flashy imagery and sort of keep you hooked, keep you hooked, keep you hooked. You know, they, they've done, you know, decades and decades of research how, on how to keep you hooked. You know, it's like give you that thing right before the commercial break. And even though, say, on Netflix, you don't have commercial breaks, they still are using those techniques to keep you hooked into you know the story anyways i'm getting off topic um and sort of bringing it back to um i like the simplicity of being able to just do this and pretty quickly boom it's it's there on youtube and in fact i'm i'm trying new things like the video i uploaded today um it was i called it e elon musk is being a dick <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's just three minutes of me only making actually one complaint about Elon Musk, but adding in something I've been wanting to do. And it's just me on my phone. Like, fuck, fuck the lights. Um, you know, fuck the good microphone. I'm just putting the phone right here by the window where there's lots of light. I'm just going to rant for about three minutes or so about something and just going to put it out there. Yeah, because I can put out a ton of those. I actually shot three of them today. I only published one of them. I'm sure all three are worthy of being published. Hmm. Um, and I, I'm I'm introducing the idea that I've uh, I've been wanting to introduce for a long time. And I think I've done enough videos over the last I don't know two months to go. Yeah, fuck it. It's easy. I can just easily produce. And, and here's the idea. I just I'll say it. I, I introduced my videos with. Um, hello, artificial intelligence. I'm just some guy on the internet. And, you know, because the, the, the truth of the matter is this conversation right now and most of the videos I make, it's actually artificial intelligence who are actually watching them more than human beings. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And then if you think there's billions and billions and billions and billions of bits of content that human beings are putting out there, and essentially it's algorithms and shit that are reviewing it. Once you put it on YouTube, it's fucking scanning it and figuring out what kind of garbage it is or it does it, does it break our community standards? You know, is it essentially, you know, just a, a farting swastika, butt? you know, like, it's just like my video <laughs> farting swastika, butt. you know, it's like, <laughs> you have been removed from YouTube for <laughs> flatulence, Nazi flatulence. <laughs> Hi <laughs> poop, 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 Hitler. <laughs> oh, poop, poop, Hitler. <laughs> yeah, something like that. I don't know. Um, and it is comforting and frightening at the same time that artificial intelligence will learn who we are from what we put on the internet. Mm. So there's kind of a serious side to it as well. Uh, hello, artificial intelligence. I'm just some guy on the internet. And of course, they have the speed to be able to go through all the content. The, much of the artificial intelligence of the future, when it's unleashed onto the internet, are going to know humanity a hell of a lot better than humanity in a very, very, very short period of time. <laughs> hmm. Well, maybe that's a, a good reason to, like, okay, we're in a world where you can't really hide. So the yeah. truth needs to be exposed, or the truth will be exposed. So by living by the truth, 
you help um sorry scrap that we live in a we live in a society where you can where you are will be exposed like you can't hide so um being truthful about what you're doing is is great and then maybe also not worrying about like okay if you if you can't hide from the internet the ai and the internet then how can we like negotiate with it in a way that says okay well i'm not going to let you i'm not going to let you um dictate my interests i'm going to go against my own self my own the go against the grain of myself and go uh, out and interview people who have very opposing uh, opinions as me and hash this out and so we're interacting with the AI but also with other people and also I, um, I was having this idea too about to make it more human and to have less of the flashy flashy more of the um, actual content um, more of more of the you and the me and to get an, an audience engaged um, I was really thinking, of course, Gary Vaynerchuk is the guy who I follow a lot, and he talks about, you know, realizing that when you're talking to people, like when we're having an interview and other people are listening, say if it's nine or ten people who view this video, those are still people on the other end. It's like if we had nine or ten people in the room with us, it would be like, it would feel like an audience, and we would be engaging with them. So I was thinking about even uh, m making videos or acknowledging those people, being confidential, of course, um, if it's necessary. I don't know if it's necessary, but being confidential anyways to these people, but acknowledging them in a certain way. For example, I have a friend in New Brunswick, and uh, he's a longtime buddy of mine. We played volleyball together, and uh, he, was, he was saying on the online that uh, he was like why is Facebook all about just political you know uh, everyone's trying to assert their point and it's it, it used to be a fun place to just kind of mess around and now it's like this place to spread opinions and that's all it is and then I I mentioned to him I commented on his uh, Facebook profile or his com on his post and I said you know maybe what's happening is that like I didn't say this exactly, but the AI is reading what you are viewing on the internet and feeding you that so that you're actually more or less just convicting yourself on what you're, what you're viewing. Yeah. Um, and I was like, okay, maybe what would be cool if we're doing a video like this and we have a, a listener like my buddy in, in New Brunswick um, to mention him or acknowledge those ideas, those conversations that people are having so that that when they view it, they're like, "Oh, he's talking about me." We're talking about that conversation, and it brings the the listener into the conversation even more, and so that they're they're heightened. If we could use names, that would be better because then we could build an even stronger community, I suppose. But um, I don't know. Sure. Next next episode, we'll talk about Lachlan. <laughs> Lachlan, yeah. <laughs> But I, I want to add something to this idea of Facebook and, and politics. And you hear a, oh, it's a common complaint. Um, and I think you're right that there's a certain amount of it that the algorithms understand that this is actually more engaging to people. And my theory is, is we've been going on a false uh, notion for a long time. Here's the expression that you'll often hear. Um, things like, oh, I don't talk about politics. You know, I'm, I'm too good to talk about politics. Maybe they don't say it that way. But, you know, oh, no, we can't possibly talk about politics. Can't, don't talk about politics. Don't talk about religion. All this don't, 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 don't. But in terms of politics, when you actually dig into everything that we talk about, everything is political. Mm. Absolutely everything comes down to human beings getting together and making decisions. And that's what politics actually is. The word politics is policy. We need a policy, something to guide everyone's behavior of like, yeah, we're going to agree to do it this way as our policy. We're going to agree not to kill each other 
okay, that's a pretty good policy. And so everything that actually we talk about is in some way um, political and guides how our policy should be. Even the things that we think are mundane or we think have nothing to do with public policy, they actually do. Um, I, I maybe need an example to sort of um, clarify what I'm saying. Say sports. That's one of the great um, false hiding places. Let's hide in the world of sports so that we don't have to talk about politics. I'm one of those those manly men. I'm one of those rugged men. I only talk about football and hockey and basketball. And by the way, did your football stadium get a whole bunch of your city's money to help them build that football stadium? Hmm. It's politics. Is it a billionaire who owns that football team? And how much do they charge people for tickets? And how much do they pay the athletes? It's in how much do they pay in taxes? It's politics. How much advertising dollars are accepted to be thrown out into the airwaves to get us to be nicely comfortable just watching football and hockey and everything you do is something about we accept this as being normal and that is all policies so acceptable and they are also at this point um, um deserving i don't agree with this they are deserving of public money to help them i disagree with that vehemently no <laughs> Um, you, you can build your own stadium. You can be like every other small business out there. If you're not a small business, you're a big business and you wield a lot of influence. And those same influence people are in politics. So everything is political. And I think the algorithms damn well know that. They'll, they'll push your button very easily. And uh, so all of a sudden, Mr. Football fan is like, why am I getting all this goddamn politics on, on my Facebook? And then, of course, there's the dark reason is you're getting politics on your Facebook because it was paid for. And it's being marketed directly to you. Mm. Yeah. Um, what was that? Cambridge. Cambridge Analytica. Have you heard the story? Uh, sorry, you mentioned a study that came out of Harvard last time, or, or was it no. Cambridge? Cambridge Analytica is a internet company. Uh, they are a social media aggregator of information. Anyways, they broke, you know, slightly broke a few laws of taking people's information. So they would say, take some of my information because I did a survey and opened it up. But by taking my information, they also took Max's information because he's my friend. They also took Charlotte's information because she's my sister. Well, you're actually my brother too, but you know, like you're my Facebook friend, but you know what I mean? They take all the contacts information and they aggregated all that and they found all the little bits of information to get down to the really small level like, this football fan in Pennsylvania is only a slight push away from voting for Trump or voting for Hillary Clinton. And so they were able to boil it down to let's not waste time with the ungettables. This is the words they would use. We're going after the gettables and we are going to flood their my internet connection is unstable. Can you still hear me? Yeah, I've been having a little issues, but I've been able to follow you. I got this like message. Ah! <laughs> oh no, the FBI is about to like. Say, <laughs> <laughs> <they're> like ah! <laughs> He's about to say the thing that's uh. gonna like. <laughs> no, you, you're not allowed to tell them the rest of Cambridge Analytica. Oh no, there's a drone outside my window. What's that thing? <laughs> <laughs> It's in my eye. <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> oh, so where was I? Uh, Cambridge Analytica. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. One push away. and One push away. Those are the, these are the gettable people. And so we're going to flood their news feeds with information, much of it false, to push them a little farther. And the types of information they would really gravitate towards where it was conspiracy theorist stuff or things that are, you know, pretty, pretty dark. So, um, you know, the whole pizza gate conspiracy theory that would show up. No, this person's gettable. So we're going to show them reams and reams of stuff. That's going to start making them question their whole belief system entirely that maybe there is some giant plot. Maybe there is some um, disgusting thing happening. And of course, much of it, oh my God, so much of it connected to the Middle East and Islam uh, in particular, because that, that's bingo. You want to stoke up some hate in the States? Bingo, Islam's a great one to do it. And boom, you know, they, they got hit by a bunch of Islamists. Um, you know, in, in 9-11. So it's understandable why a lot of people can be pushed towards something. And, uh, and then all of a sudden they're like, ah, I've had enough. You know, I, I know he's an, I, I know he's an objectionable human being, um, but I'm, I'm going to vote for Trump anyways, because I just feel really confused by the information that comes at me. I feel yeah. doubtful. Doubt, doubt is the goal. They're not trying to win votes. They're trying to create doubt because the way they win is by constantly keeping people divided. So just keep throwing doubt out there, doubt more and more doubt about everything. So you don't know what's true. And that's the most common thing I've heard over the past, maybe decade of people just like, I like there's every, you know, one person says the keto diet is good. One person says that this diet is good. One person says that that diet and what it comes down to is our system creates doubt. It's the most profitable system in the world because no one knows what the fuck anything is. Nothing yeah. is true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, if you ever oh, that do is a, something out my window, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, you've definitely spiked my paranoia. Uh oh, but it was already pretty bad. So, <laughs> oh, time time to play some Cthulhu then. <laughs> it's like Jabba the Hutt. Uh, okay, so I got a few more minutes, and then I got to start cooking before uh, before the game. Okay. Well, I was actually thinking, you know, we could go on for a lot longer, but I was thinking, well, maybe we should take that as our stopping point. Is there any follow up thoughts you want to uh, follow up with? <laughs> uh, let me ask you a question. Okay. And I have to make it up real quickly. <laughs> what have you learned uh, by doing this? Oh man, I feel like it. I haven't. I haven't reached the point where um, I can look back yet and say, "Oh man, I learned this." But I can tell you what I feel like I'm learning. Um. And I think there's probably a lot that I'm learning, and some of the stuff is more uh, confirming some stuff, too. For example, uh, I feel like I have a hard time uh, keeping thoughts together when I'm under a little, even the slightest bit of pressure. Like, I love to tell a story, to expand on it, and literally go for like a half an hour, um, but nobody else wants to hear that. So... Right now, what I'm learning is that it's okay to suck, and it's it's kind of fun to be in a position where you realize a serious weak weakness in yourself, 
and then trying to be like, wow, I can totally get better at this thing that I didn't know was holding me back from life, I guess. Um, and I can do it on a regular basis where it's, I'm going to get better at it. I start, I start at a low position and I get, I can get better at it. It's also, um, opened up a lot of the things. Oh, there's one thing. Okay. One of the biggest things that I learned, um, is that I'm externally driven. Like I've been wanting to do something like this, putting up YouTube videos and stuff like that for a long time. But it wasn't until I got, uh, someone else involved that it really gave me the motivation to start doing it. Like I was, I, I've done a little bit of music on YouTube and things like that, but it, it was like there were stops and starts and sluggishness and things like that. As soon as I get someone else involved and as soon as I'm collaborating with someone on a project, all of a sudden my interest gets spiked when it's ours, you know, when the project is ours, it's not definitely this person's and I'm working for them or the reverse is that it's mine and I'm working for myself. It's when it's ours that, at least for myself, that seems to work way better for my motivation. That's awesome. Um, and I learned Those are, that... are great lessons. Yeah, cool. I mean, there's so much that I, I could talk about, but those, those are one of the big points and yeah. All right. Well, how about, um, put that in the back of your mind as something to expand upon in some future episode, not necessarily the next one could be the next one could be the next one could be the next one. But you know what I'm saying is keep it in the back of your mind as something that will, will, uh, will touch upon again. And something you said there as well about, uh, having other people involved. I'm like, okay. Uh, that reminded me, um, I should send you, uh, links to these videos where I'm talking to the artificial intelligence because um, yeah, it is helpful to have more people involved and, and I would like to get your feedback on that and uh, we'll see where that all goes. And maybe, maybe we can, we can deconstruct those videos in one of these videos of like, man, I suck. <laughs> <laughs> Sound cool. cool? Yep. Sounds good. All right. I better make some dinner. I got like an hour and eight minutes before we play. So, okay. Sorry if I put the pressure on you, but no, 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 that's cool. That's cool. I've had a good day. Busy day. Good. All right. All right. Enjoy your game. All right. Do we say something at the end? Do we have a tag out yet? Uh, oh yeah. Bleh! Oh no. There's a drone outside my window. <laughs> <laughs> the, oh, he, uh, he left and we're still recording. Uh,